Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, great to see all of you and great to have a good uh, mix, I should say, of panelists here to talk about what will cause the next uh, recession. And, you know, I kind of want to start on a, on a global or maybe a macro level because I, I think all of you have been asked this question repeatedly over the last year, uh, which is when you look at the macro picture, where does the U.S.-China trade issue fall into the risk category? And Peter, I want to start with you on how you are viewing these discussions about a potential phase one trade deal. Is it a real deal? What do you think the outcome will mean for the broader picture? Well, <clears throat> for the few people who are interested in this topic, uh, and I think it is the topic, uh, right? We, we're in a world right now that is dynamic and changing. Uh, it is global. Uh, China this cycle is incredibly important. Uh, it did not suffer the same crisis uh, that other economies did after uh, the banking crisis here and in Europe. And so everyone is focused on the trade war as something that is driving the slowdown. Now, I think it's exacerbated and pulled forward the slowdown, certainly. But I think there were structural issues that preceded the trade war, and we saw global growth slowing well in advance of the trade war. So while I think a resolution of the trade war would certainly be helpful, it actually would not change my overall thesis regarding the global slowdown and U.S. recession, which our base case, frankly, is we're going to see a slowdown and likely a recession uh, in 2020. Now, a phase one deal. Um, it's made up. It's a made up thing, right? These phases are made up. It's been our expectation for some time it would be very difficult to get a comprehensive deal. And the reason it would be difficult to get a comprehensive deal is because it's a very complex dynamic. It involves not only soybeans, uh, but it involves intellectual property theft. It involves complex geopolitical issues, control of the South China Sea. There's a lot going on here uh, that will not, and I don't think can and cannot be resolved in the time period before the next election, which is exactly why it was very cleverly designed, divided up into phases. So at least we could get partial resolution before the election, and it would appear, in fact, that we were getting somewhere. It's my belief that a phase one deal, especially if it concedes rollbacks on tariffs, is a bad deal and really no deal whatsoever. Uh, Frank, let me bring you into the conversation because you've got a unique uh, view from the other side as uh, the treasurer of the China Construction Bank here in New York. How do you think the Chinese view this? If you look at the macro picture, the deceleration and growth that we've seen in China over the last few years, how important or how big of a catalyst would even a phase one deal be for China? Well, I think it's um, a phase one would be a, a very good step for China. I, I think we uh, need need to take a step back and think about China has been addressing in the last uh, beginning in 2007, 18, they wanted to make reforms, which would be that to reduce some of the debt and the growth of the debt. Uh, I think what the trade war did was was provide a new hurdle and obstacle that wasn't expected. Um, so I think that this is a really positive first step. I think I agree with Peter that the reason there are phases is because it's very complex. I mean, there's intellectual property issues, there's a number of different issues. But I think it's important when you hear things like President Trump saying that China wants it more than we want it. I think that both sides need to make eventually a deal. If we look at the Chinese economy, I think the impact to the manufacturing sector and this slow down in the manufacturing is um, accentuated. I think currently, if we look at what Chinese growth is, 60 to 70 percent is based on consumption. So if we think about that, I don't think the impact is as, shall we say, impactful as, as the U.S. would like. I think both needed very importantly. I think the consumer is really going to continue to carry China. I don't know if anybody's aware, but today was Singles Day. And Alibaba made somewhat of a record. I think it's amazing, 30 billion. I think 38 the, billion. 38 billion. Thank you. The last one I saw. So I think as we go, as, as China goes forward, I think they're going to look more to the consumer. Consumer is going to help drive that growth, and I think that's really going to be more important going forward. Uh, we're going to get much more into what the domestic picture looks like for China, but I want to bring the conversation here to the U.S. Um, you talked about the strength in consumption over in China. Well, 
uh, Jen, you could certainly argue that uh, consumers have been kind of right at, at the pillar of the economy. We keep hearing that despite the manufacturing slowdown, despite the drop in business investment, consumers are still strong, and that's why the U.S. can continue on this path of growth. How sustainable do you think that the sentiment is, and, and what would you think maybe sour some of that sentiment that we're seeing right now? Well, I'd have to say that I don't think we can really have a recession here without a huge exogenous event or the consumer slowing down since the consumer is 70% of the economy. And the consumer, in my view, has never been healthier. Now, you know, I, I ran three credit card banks, national banks, that basically went to the consumer. We could certainly see banks restrict the consumer. They could get much more restrictive than they are today, and they've moved, been moving a little that way, but I don't think they're going to move far enough to, to hit the consumer. And I think that until unemployment starts to rise, and, you know, we, every number we see is 3.5% unemployment, we see 3% wage growth or a little more if you're a non-supervisory, and we see people coming into the workforce every time we get a new report. Now, we, I think the last time we saw the numbers, the uh, participation rate was the highest it's been in a long time. So there's still slack, and yet the consumer's still strong and still getting raises, maybe not at the level that we would all like to see. And if you were here for the earlier panel, they were talking about it being about 1% 1, 1 in real world. But the fact is it continues to grow, and it continues to be positive, and the consumer continues to have a job. And as long as that's true, something's going to have to make that consumer back off. It's not going to be tariffs. That's not, they're not looking at that. They're not looking at the ISM. They're not looking at any of the measures that we look at up here. All they're looking at is their pocketbook and the fact that they've got a job, and they're spending, and they're going to continue to spend, and we're going to have a 4% Christmas, and it's going to be a damned hard time to get a recession out of that. So they're not looking at the tariffs yet, but isn't there an argument to be made that if there is the December 15th tariffs that go into effect, keep, consumers are going to start to see that in their pocketbooks because those no, are No, companies are going to see it in their pocketbook because we have a worldwide oversupply of goods. There's no freaking way they're going to start raising prices. What they're going to do is go broke at a faster pace. So you will see damage, but it'll come to the retailer. It's not going to come to the consumer, not in any measurable amount. There's just no way to pass it through. See, Han, let, let me bring you into the conversation. Um, you said that all this talk of the strength of the consumer is a bit of a misconception there. How do you view that picture here in the U.S.? Well, first of all, I think we, we all acknowledge the importance of consumption in the U.S. If you look at most recent GDP data, right, GDP increased about 1.9%. And if you look at the underlying drivers, capital spending is declining. Residential construction is declining net exports are declining. So what's growing is consumption. Consumption's up 3%. So basically, what's carrying the US economy at this point is just household sector consumption. Obviously, it's important to look at unemployment rate, which is record low, less than 3%. But then, as I mentioned earlier, wage growth over the past four years, inflation adjusted, it's only about 1% a year. And also, if you look at the quality of jobs being added to the economy, right? we're not adding high-paying manufacturing finance jobs. We're adding a lot of low-paying jobs. And the job growth for people without a high school diploma far exceeded job growth for people with a high school diploma or a college degree. So the quality of jobs or the level of pay we add to these jobs is not very high quality, very low-paid jobs we're adding to the economy. So I think that is very problematic. And end of the day, um, as I mentioned earlier, household sector is really not benefiting from this retro low interest rate. You can argue that that service cost is low, but then how do you service your debt? You, you need to earn money to service your debt. If your wage growth is so low, you just don't really have much room to service your debt, even though interest rates are going lower. So, so what does that suggest? I mean, if you say that the quality of jobs that are being created are not high quality jobs. Where are we in the cycle? I think we're obviously late in the economic cycle. I think, you know, 
whether we have recession next year is debatable, but obviously I think we are going to be stuck in this low growth mode. I don't think the central bank stimulus from the Federal Reserve or just global central bank stimulus is enough to support the economy. Um, so we're going to continue to have this low growth mode. And once we get some sort of exogenous shock, I think it's very possible we slip into a recession, um, whether that shock comes from stock market or some sort of global economic slowdown. I don't know, but I think that, that is a risk. The economy is pretty vulnerable. The consumption is vulnerable. Peter, you agree? Yeah, no, I'd like to amplify that. And, and, and Jan's made some great points. The consumer is strong, but let's, let's think about how historical cycles have looked. The consumer always looks fabulous right before the fall. Doesn't mean the fall is coming, but let's talk about 3.5% unemployment. The last two times, unemployment's been at 3.5%. We were with, at a, with a recession within six months. What causes the cycle and what causes consumption to slow, it's one thing, availability to credit, because wage growth is not there. We're starting to see banks tighten lending standards to the consumer in revolving credit in particular. We're ta we have a, a, a business where we talk to middle market banks. They're tightening lending standards. The past couple quarters, they've been concerned for the first time since I've been having my calls with them over the past three, three and a half years. So I think that's the catalyst. And the consumer often will just flip a switch. They look in their wallet, and the wallet has a 50 in it. The next week, they look in their wallet. Their wallet doesn't have anything in it. Their credit card is maxed out, and their credit card limit was just cut. Boom, there you have it. Uh, the exogenous events that have been occurring are global. It's a global, it is a synchronized global slowdown that cannot be ignored. Because the mechanism from companies to consumers is employment. Companies do start to feel it. What happens? They cut jobs. And the other thing is, we agree, Jen, that there is an oversupply globally of stuff, especially in basic industrial stuff. And the reason for that is QE. Companies have termed out debt. Yield curves are flat, negative, not inverted here in the US anymore, but flat and, and negative in, in Europe. And that creates overinvestment. Companies are overinvesting in plant and equipment globally, especially in emerging markets. You can't get pricing power. You can't get pricing power. That hurts your profits eventually. So let's pick up on what you mentioned on the yield curve, because that, that's another thing that we've been watching closely in terms of how significant uh, that is an indicator of a recession. We all remember in August there was a big sell-off on the back of an inversion, which some said it wasn't a real inversion. Uh, how much of what we're seeing in the curve is a result of central banks outside of the U.S.? We're looking at the ECB as well as the BOJ on negative rates. How much of that is anchoring what's happening here? Yeah, look, that's been our thesis for some time. We modified our internal models to include this anchoring effect about two and a half years ago. That's why we got our yield curve forecast correct this year when everybody else was off. You now, Frank and I were talking a little bit about this and whether or not the yield curve is a, uh, a harbinger of recession. And if you think that rates are low globally just because, and there's no reason for it, then well, maybe it isn't. But our thesis at Canner is that it's low for a reason. And the reason is the ECB and the BOJ and other central banks, Switzerland and, and elsewhere, have kept rates low to negative because growth is so bad in the rest of the world. And by the way, it's mostly structural. Japan, it's demographics. Europe, it's demographics plus lack of fiscal unity. Even some of the problems that we're seeing in China go back to this transition from export to consumer economy. That's, that's, a, real, that's a really difficult thing to transition into. GDP, 55% consumer in China last, last uh, quarter. 60% this quarter. So my, my point is very simple. The yield curve does matter because the U.S. will not be able to escape the slowdown in global growth and the transmission mechanism, in fact. It's causal is the yield curve because as the curve inverts, NIMS compress for banks, they become less willing to lend, and boom, eventually that affects the pillar of the economy, which is Jan's uh, consumer, which he's, he knows so well. So, so that's the transmission mechanism in my mind. I don't disagree with any of what he, what you just said, um, but I just don't think it's happening yet. When you talk to the consumer, you have to ask them three questions. Do you have a job? Will you keep your job? If you lost your job, could you get another one paying just as much or more? And as, if more of them say yes this year than last year, they don't quit spending unless the banks stop mm -hmm. them. But even if the banks slow them down at this point, the consumer's healthier than we think they are. I know there's a lot of thesis about is the consumer really healthy, but they have not acted during this 
prosperity period like the consumer normally acts. They've kept their savings rate relatively high. They've actually paid down debt. It, it's something different than what we've seen them do before. The consumer actually has dry powder. So the banks are going to have to move the numbers pretty far to slow them down in the short term. Do I think there's going to be another recession? Hell yes, I do. We haven't repealed the, the cycle. But I just don't, I think you're going to have to hit the consumer pretty damn hard between the eyes with the two by four to get their attention to get them to stop spending. And it's going to have to be something that stops their ability to get credit or something that makes them go, oh my God, maybe I couldn't get another job. I think we're pretty far from that. That, that will be the interesting thing to see. Uh, Frank, you know, um, picking up on the point about the, the, the yield curve, how do you think that we should be viewing what's happening there in terms of the recession risk? Should we view it differently because of sort of the, um, what we have seen or how we've seen central banks act since the financial crisis? Well, I, I think that I would, I would disagree with Peter because I do think that there is a, a level of, of of, of um, buying in the markets because of the QE and negative rates, et cetera. And if I could just pivot a little to, to maybe China and the China economy, why in relation to the US and Europe, uh, I think China has a better chance of offsetting a recession and better navigating the headwinds. I mean, um, I joined China Construction five years ago and I thought it was pretty amazing to learn about the economic structure of the Chinese economic system. And it's very different and unique from that of the US and, and uh, Europe. In China, um, there's really a, a, a very efficient transmission system of monetary and, policy, monetary and fiscal policy. So as everybody knows, the, the, the ways to manage recessions and negative economics is to either implement monetary or fiscal policy. China has a unique structure. When they want to move, they can move within a week or a month. We've seen that whether it's in fiscal policy or monetary policy. And another point to contrast China versus the US and Europe, Europe has negative rates. The US is down to, now we're down to, I don't know, the Fed is struggling on a day-to-day -day basis with the repo market and the plumbing. But China's loan rate is still 4%. China's rates are high, so they have a monetary policy through the reserve ratio requirement, through the lending rate, and a fiscal policy where they can deliver very quickly results to uh, target their economy. So just to distinguish in an emerging market of China the difference between the recession risk for the US, I think probably Europe's already in a recession, um, just to point that out. Just but but isn't there an argument to be made that maybe China doesn't have the same levers that it had during the financial crisis? You talk about the stimula uh, stimulative side of things. I mean, China had, what was it, near $600 billion stimulus uh, during 2008. Um, we're looking at a different phase in the Chinese economy where it's a lot more mature, where uh, there is a lot more, uh, at least an attempt to try and rein in the debt. Uh, how does that affect how the Chinese navigate the slowdown that we've been seeing over the last several years. So certainly uh, I agree with your point about the debt. And if we look at, just take a, a, another step back, a, a year or two years ago, they wanted to implement the reforms. And because as we said, the tariffs, they've, they've been slowing down, but they are identifying that they need to control their, their debt. Now they've implemented a number of practical controls, prudent controls, as you can see, if you follow cross-border investment. I mean, two years ago, China was buying everything in sight, and now they've put in prudential measures to stop that. They've changed the way that, that debt is created in, in China. Uh, if you look at the balance sheet, if we look at China like a corporation, you look at the balance sheet, the, the big issue is, well, the Chinese debt is 250% compared to the GDP, but it's also a country of savers, where GDP is 46% from 2018 was put into savings. If you look at the, the level of deposits to GDP, that's 200%. If you look at the, the cash, the balance sheet, they have three trillion sitting in excess reserves. That's a lot to have an ammunition to go in case of they have to increase the stimulus. Uh, and and uh, I guess finally, it's a, uh, it's, it is a country of savers, as I said. Uh, so I think that China does have the I mean, if you look at it as a, as a balance sheet, 
They have a current account surplus, so they're creating cash flow. They have money in the bank, uh, and they have plenty of ways to target stimulus, which is very different than the U.S., which we can't do fiscal policy. We can't agree on anything. Again, it's a targeting system. Uh, in fact, China just passed a, a, a recent uh, uh, proposal that they're going to divert more revenue from the central government to the local governments because it's a better way to target specifically to get the economy going in different points. So I just think whenever there's a conversation about recession and the, uh, the ability of the government to instill um, um, stimulus, I think China is a completely different, unique situation that I don't think most people are aware of or really think about. Sihan, do you, do you agree with that assessment? I mean, if you look at what China has done so far, there have been several triple R cuts. We've seen tax cuts implemented as well. How effective do you think that has been uh, in trying to contain the slowdown in the Chinese economy? And what are the additional levers we should be looking for? I think I think uh, has more more firepower than the Federal Reserve or ECB. Um, just uh, some some statistics. If you look at hiking cycles, right, Federal Reserve interest rate hiking cycles, since 1945, there have been 12 interest rate hiking cycles by the Federal Reserve. And 11 out of 12 cycles, economy ended up in a recession, okay? Only once U.S. economy had a soft landing after interest rate hike. That was 1994. So that tells you Federal Reserve really does not have a good track record to engineer a soft landing. Another fact, a lot of people look at the yield curve, yield curve inverted, people worry about recession, and now the yield curve has re-steepened, and it seems the concerns have been alleviated, but the fact is, recession doesn't happen when the curve inverted. Recession happens one and two years after the curve inverted, and recession happens after the curve re-steepened, because the Federal Reserve is reactive. They hike too much, they start to cut rates, and the curve will re-steepen, but at that time, it's too late because monetary policy takes time to show up in the economy. Um, not, the, the, the third fact is uh, negative interest rate or zero interest rate does not really induce spending, right? It's actually very harmful for spending because now you just destroy retirement, uh, retired people's in interest income. Um, so it's actually very negative for consumption. Peter, you agree? I think Sihan read our morning note. Uh, yes, we, we agree. That's precisely correct. Late cycle cuts rarely, if ever, prevent recession. Recessions happen. I would even see a little bit sooner than that, three to six months after the steepening uh, begins. And that steepening typically happens because, precisely because the Fed is hiking, and we have another 150 basis points to go. And that's not going to prevent recession, if you ask me. And to the China point, points, I think, if you don't mind, uh, that, that Frank was making, Obviously, Frank has tactility with China and the Chinese economy that we do not hear uh, working for, for uh, Chinese Construction Bank. However, all that said, uh, from the outside looking in, I'd, I'd make a few observations. The first is that when you look at the data and you look at, and, and to the extent that the data can be relied upon, no, no offense, Frank, to the extent that the data can be relied upon. We've heard that before. Yeah, I know. Um, when, when you look at the data and you look at the efficacy of triple R cuts, for example, for small businesses, they're cut down to 8.5%. For large, for large enterprises, they're at 13.5%. And when you look at the reactiveness of GDP or money supply to triple R cuts, it's just not there. Money supply doesn't move. It's growing at about 8, 8.5% no matter what they do. Here's what we think is going on, and I don't think this is outside the realm of reason, and it is supported by a partner we have who conducts primary source surveys in China, both on the financial side as well as on the economic activity side. And what that seems to show is that default rates are rising in China, and they're rising much faster than the official data might suggest. And so what's happening is all of these targeted measures, whether it's aggregate financing that's being provided directly to the regional banks or SOEs, or it's whether it's through triple R cuts, whatever that is, when you see that aggregate finance, uh, financing number go up, it's being sopped up by new loans that are made into the, ma being made to the same companies that are currently in default. So it's not going to, to stimulate the Chinese economy. And that is in fact why the rate of growth of the Chinese economy is decelerating. 
So we, you know, we think China is going to be forced to lower its GDP forecast and target uh, over the next several years for that reason. The stimulus is not going to the real economy, any, economy anymore. What kind of number are we talking about? We're looking at what six percent growth right now. Are we, five yeah, I mean, we're not, five? we're not, uh, we're not overboard, and we haven't actually calculated a forecast, but we think we could see it over the next couple years down a percent at least, and that's meaningful. Even though China is not going to be in recession, the world is reliant on China's growth. Seventy percent of global growth is now coming from emerging markets. China being probably sixty percent of that. So as China's growth rate of growth decelerates. So does the rate of growth for the world, and that is going to affect everybody, especially de developed economies like Europe, U.S., Japan. And you're seeing it. I mean, one of the reasons why Europe is slowing as much as it is is because of China. Uh, that, that segues um, nicely to, to sort of the response that we are likely to see if there is some kind of recession. Uh, I was reminded recently at a conversation with the Indian finance minister who said that what she is seeing right now in terms of the volatility globally is exactly what she saw back in 2008. But she worries that there is no synchronized response um, that is likely to come because we are seeing so many fragmentation, a lot of it stemming from trade tensions. Um, when you look globally at the way central banks are operating, how well positioned are they to see the kind of response that we saw back in 2008? Jan, you want to take that one? Well, I guess that would be one of my biggest concerns about what's going to happen because, you know, I say the consumer here is resilient. They are. I think the Chinese consumer has been much more resilient than we would have expected. That number today of $38 billion bucks out of Alibaba's singles day, okay, that's one data point, but, I mean, we're talking about slowing growth. That slowing growth looks like 25% growth in those sales. But it wasn't, you know, if you went back to 2009 when they launched this thing, they did about 8 billion bucks. Today they did 38 billion bucks. But JD did 30 billion bucks. They didn't do anything in 2009. This is not just what the growth we're seeing is. This is across the marketplace in China. So clearly that middle income consumer that wasn't even there in 2009 for a lot of, in a lot of respects is there now. And their capability to spend is quite high. The question is, can you get them to? The other thing we saw today is U.S. goods did really, really freaking well. The 22,000 brands internationally that came in today, plus the 200,000 brands that were already there playing, the consumer accepted them really, really well. We thought there was some fight going on between the Chinese consumer and the U.S. manufacturer. There isn't. There's a fight going on between the U.S. government and the Chinese government, but the consumers didn't act like they gave a damn today. And we've been hearing all of this, how you know they were resisting our goods and all. None of that showed up in the numbers. So something like that is going to have to change as well to see this press down on the Chinese economy further. So yeah, I, I worry about the central banks being able to respond, but I'm a little less worried than I was about the worldwide consumer's response at the moment. But the, the, the 38 point, what was it? Four, 38 point change billion, yeah. 38 point change billion. I think it was 0.2 actually. The, the growth rate was the slowest, as you point out. It's pretty flat from last year, but it was the slowest in 11 years. I mean, how do you, how do you, well, how do you view something that? Like that number was only 30 billion bucks last year, 38 this year. Mm -hmm. That's pretty good growth rate for any place but Alibaba in China. But, you know, and like I say, in JD.com, grew just as much from last year. So it was a really big growth in dollars, even though the growth rate wasn't what we've seen for the last several years. I so the consumer looked fine to me. Just add a couple of fun facts to that. It's China is an emerging market, and so then, and I've heard a lot of times about can we trust the numbers? But over the years, in any emerging market, the numbers get better. The government uh, gets a little more prudential in how they review. It's important to note that, that Finally, China is opening up very much. They've allowed rating agencies to finally come in. S&P is in. They've just rated some of the top banks, of course, uh, strong and, and very well. But it's important when you think about the consumer, they are young and growing. So the demographics, the young people, are those that are going to spend. And I can tell you, I have a number of them that work for me, and they're constantly shopping. So it's also there's a level of expertise with with um, 
um, buying on the smartphone, for example. In China, I think 600 billion, uh, uh, 600, um, yeah, 600 million, I'm sorry, 600 million people at a 1.4 already buying on, on the, their smartphone app. There's 800 eight, million bought today. Yeah, I'm sure. There's, one, there's 800 million internet users. So as China continues to grow, and this is where, in, in my thesis, China's economy will be fine. It'll navigate through the debt. It'll navigate because of the evolving from a, a transformation from the manufacturing to the economy and uh, the almighty consumer is young and vibrant in China, and, and they like to buy. Um, See, Han, how, how well positioned do you think central banks are, if we kind of kind of bring the conversation back, yeah, sorry. Uh, sorry. in response, or to respond to the next financial crisis? Yeah, I, I think that's what I'm mostly worried about, is, is central banks and also just, uh, you know, fiscal policies as well, uh, a very, really do not have much firepower left. If you look at previous recessions, Federal Reserve was able to cut interest rates about, on average, 500 basis points. This time around, they hiked to 2.5%, and then they started to cut. They already cut 75 basis points. That's already 30%. So they have another 175 basis points left. And what are they going to do next? Probably they have to get back to quantitative easing. Same on the fiscal side. If you look at the Federal Reserve government deficit, right, we're running $1 trillion deficit for a $20 trillion economy, which is pretty significant. And it's not just the US. If you look at ECB, they cannot really, they never got a chance to even hike interest rates following the European sovereign crisis. Now they had to go back to lower interest rates again and re go back to quantitative easing. Same with Japan, right? Since they packed the interest rate to 0%, they never got a chance to move away from that target. Um, and at this point, all the G10 countries are cutting interest rates. It's not just US or ECB, it's also Australia, New Zealand, uh, you know, all the major countries are cutting interest rates. So I think it's, it's, it's very uh, problematic. I think, I think just not much firepower left. And what's the consequence for that? I think probably we're gonna go into a financial bubble because end of the day, you're not gonna really get much inflation. You just generate inflation, not inflation in goods and services. It's gonna be inflation in financial assets. So right now we have this situation. It's just everything feels a little bit like a bubble, all the financial assets. I think the bears on the panel have the bull's flank, sorry. I mean, that makes it tough for you guys in the middle, but you know, look, we, we agree. Uh, I agree with you, Sihan. Um, there's not the firepower left. David Wilcox, who's the former director of research at the Fed, has actually made this very point uh, many times. Moreover, even if we look at a more recent episode, like 2016, we had synchronized central bank coordination at the G20 meeting in Shanghai. If we recall, we had a slowdown here in the US, we had an earnings recession, we had a wand devaluation fears, and central banks collectively came together and stimulated between February and the end of 2016 in the amount of about 1.3 trillion, okay? We, that, that's not gonna happen now. Number one, because the firepower is not there, uh, because rates are already negative, uh, and because of the trade war. Um, importantly, I think, you know, people talk about the growth in balance sheets uh, at central banks. It's really important to understand it is not a, quant a quantity of money phenomenon. It is a rates phenomenon. If we look at 2016, the Bund was yielding 50, positive 50 basis points. The Bund got as low as minus 75 basis points at about minus 30 basis points right now. QE in Europe is not stimulative anymore. In fact, there's an argument which we've written about that negative rates are actually dis-stimulative, if that's a word. Um, so really there is not much firepower in Japan, in Europe, uh, and there's a lot, to Sihan's point, there's a lot less firepower here in the US. And uh, I, I don't think it's whatever the firepower is, it's not gonna be quick enough to prevent recession. And on the fiscal policy side, it's really more of the same. We're running trillion dollar deficits. And by the way, one of the reasons we saw the dislocation in the repo market was because there was an oversupply of collateral in the repo market that caused the dislocation because of T-bill auctions funding deficit. The Fed has since pumped about two, $300 billion into the markets, that's balance sheet growth. But that's not QE. That's simply to stabilize the repo market. So there's not a lot of firepower left, and we just don't think it's going to be enough to prevent the next cycle. Do you think we'll ever get to a point here in the U.S. Uh, of negative rates? I mean, that's something that's been floated around there. Uh, the argument being that, look, it, it hasn't worked in a place like Europe, hasn't worked in Japan. But as you pointed out, there are demographic issues that have led to the lag. Um, are we going to see that here in the U.S.? And how effective could that kind of policy be? 
I don't think there's any likelihood we're going to get to a point of inflation. And I borrowed 460 million bucks, or yeah, 460 million bucks at one point in time at 16 and two thirds percent. You couldn't find that, you know, if you had to, right? We paid it all back, believe it or not. And if you'd have told me that we could run deficits like we're running now and there would be no inflationary impact, I would have gone, there's no way that could happen. Who would have thought when we did a big tax cut a year ago and it would drive no inflation? Why didn't it? Main reason it didn't is because that huge tax cut that all the retailers got, Walmart being a good example, they turned around and handed it back to the consumer. They literally drove price down with it. Why is that? Because there's a worldwide oversupply of stuff, as you said. So do I think we could get to negative rates? Yes. Do I think they'll work? I don't think they've worked already any place. I sure as hell don't think they're going to work here. And I sure hope we don't get there because it means really bad stuff is happening. But no, I don't think we can cut our way to prosperity from the point of view of the Federal Reserve. And I don't think the European Central Bank can't happen. They, well, look at Japan, how they stagnated forever, right? Low interest rates will not solve this issue. We need something to solve the issue, but my concern is that we'll never get any kind of coordination for just what you said. It's not, we're not in a trade fight with Japan. We're in a fight over intellectual poverty. We're in a fight over the militarization of the South China Sea. We're in a fight over China 2025. We're in a fight over Road and Belt Initiative. All of that stuff, commerce and the administration freaking hate. And that's why they're pounding them with tariffs. But you can't get above 525 billion in tariffs because that's all there is. And we're going to be there next if we make one more step. And I don't even think that's going to drive up pricing to the consumer in America. You're not going to see that show up as an inflationary component. If anything, it'll show up as a deflationary component because it'll wreck the freaking economy. Isn't that crazy that monetary policy has actually led to disinflation and deflation rather than inflation, and the central bankers still don't seem to get it? It's confusing. Yeah, people like me get it. Central bank doesn't get it. Yeah, Everybody complained about the tax cut, and I said, this is going to be freaking deflationary. Nobody wanted to listen to me when I said that because they're all freaking economists. They've never sold a piece of goods to a consumer. So I would agree with all my panelists is that there's very little firepower left and we think that and we all agree that negative rates really don't have a positive impact. So I guess we can put that all on our wall of worry as our most important worry right now is that, that there's very little that the uh, central banks in Europe and US and Japan can do right at this point. And I'd like, I hope somebody can come up with some solution because we're not sure what the solution is. Is at this point. By the way, I'm not just another pretty face in retailing. I did do my doctoral work in finance at St. Louis Shoe, so I've studied this stuff in the context of retailing, and it just scares the heck out of me. So well, let's sort of pivot the conversation to talk about um, investing, how you should be positioning yourself in the face of these risks. And Frank, I want to start with you on this because you brought up an interesting point um, on a call that we had previously where uh, we've seen where uh, bond yields in, in China have been. You've talked about the Bond Connect program. Um, which was established back in 2016, I believe, 2017. Um, what kind of inflows have you seen on that front? So it's it's a great point. So we, you know, it's so obvious to anybody looking for yield in, in the alternative asset world, but it's not so obvious because people are always a little concerned about China. But um, yields in the 10 year in, in, in for the China government, three and a half percent. So you look at that versus the U.S. Treasury at 180, and you look at that versus the Bundesbank, which is minus 50, which I don't understand why anybody would, in the world would buy. Uh, and you think about, well, why has not there been more traction in the Chinese bond market at a bond connect? So I just want to point out two important milestones. And so in any uh, market, you need liquidity and you need access. And in liquidity and access, especially in a, an emerging market, you need it in the currency and you need it to get the bonds. So a couple of important milestones for people to, that, that might not know, in 2016, uh, from the currency perspective, the IMF uh, announced that the RMB was now a reserve currency. So that's an important step, important milestone. It's now one of the top five. It's on the SWIFT payments. It's number five. In the SWIFT payment system, I think China has 1,700 participants now in the RMB space. Uh, interestingly to know if there's anybody here from uh, JP Morgan, 
the markets are opening up significantly, but in, there's a, uh, globally there's about 20, 30, uh, 25 to 30 renminbi clearing currency hubs outside of China to enable the, 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 the liquidity. Uh, it's just announced in 2018 that JP Morgan and the Bank of China are opening a clearing hub in the US. So the currency is becoming more liquid and more international. Um, the Bond Connect, as you said, just announced in 2017, 2018, it, it overshadows or, or overcomes the QIFI or RQIFI system, if those are familiar with that, which was a lot of, I think the RQIFI stood for red tape and quicksand because you couldn't get started in that. So the Bond Connect now, you can buy, open an account, there's over 1,400 uh, investors that are positioning themselves, the important thing is to position themselves, uh, that are, are ready to go in the Bond Connect. You deal through Hong Kong, it's as if you're dealing with the mainland. So Bond Connect is starting to get traction. Where's the traction? So you have your liquidity and the currency, you have the Bond Connect, the easy access. How are, is the markets really starting to grow? Well, we finally have bond index inclusion. So whether it's the Bloomberg, uh, emerging market or JP Morgan, they've announced that now that they're going to be in, in um, to, they are formally buying and announced that they're increasing up to 5%. Finally, if, from the correlation point of view, it's great to, to as a hedge. Uh, so there are so many positives for the uh, working towards the um, liquidity and access to, to for the Bond Connect. So it's, as, I, as, we, as we talked about offline, uh, it's a great alternative and great yield at this point. Can I ask a question? Yeah. One thing that's freaking me out is what's going on in Hong Kong from the point of view of this could be the exogenous shock that gets us all to yeah. down the road to recession because I think it's a big enough deal for both China and the U.S. that it could be. But I'm just wondering if I'm prejudiced because we did so much work in Hong Kong and we had such big businesses there. Mm -hmm. But it, Hong Kong is going to hell in a handbasket right now when it comes to the consumer. But it's also being really tough on people trying to do business there, not just with the consumer, but in general. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's a very difficult situation there, um, so it's hard. I, I, I do know that um, it's a concern, and we, we just want a, the, the most positive outcome is what I can say, but it certainly is a concern. My question is, if it's not a positive outcome, could it be the thing that tips the whole freaking world into recession? Sihan, you want to take that one? I, th I think I'd like to respond to the earlier question, what's the, what's the investment opportunities? Um, I, I do think everything is kind of in, kind of very expensive, right? Equity, if you look at private equity, look at WeWork, obviously some of the private equity valuation does not make much sense. If you look at the public equity, you know, stock market from, uh, you know, cyclicality adjusted basis, PE ratio is very high. If you look at bond yield, 10 year yield, 1.9% when you have 2% inflation, that seems very low yield, very high valuation for bonds. So where is the opportunity? I think the opportunity is in, in gold because at this point, we're gonna be stuck in this low growth mode for the global economy. So what's everyone gonna do, right? Central bank policy, monetary policy is at its limits. Fiscal policy, not much firepower left. What's gonna happen is everyone, every country would like to have weak currency. So everyone's gonna try to weaken their own currency. If you look at US, obviously, you know, Trump has complained about the strength of US dollar. Warren's talking about actively manage US dollar to help the manufacturing sector. If you look at Bank of Canada, they have not cut rates this year. They're the best performing currency. Now the central bank is talking about commodity prices are going, up, going down, but then somehow our currency has not really weakened in their statement, in their official statement. So they're not happy with the strength of their currency. Australian central bank, they're talking about, we have to follow, watch closely and follow what other central banks do. If they're talking, basically they're saying, if they're talking rates, we have to cut rates. So in this kind of environment, it's just everyone's trying to devalue their currency, then what's gonna go up? I think gold is ultimately the alternative, alternative currency. So I think gold prices will go up. Uh, Peter, I'm going to give the last word to you. He says gold is the best position to take right now in the face of risks. What's the advice you give? I don't, I don't mind gold as rates go down. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm not a gold bug by any means, um, but, but I don't disagree with that whatsoever. Uh, I would say being long duration is still one of our favorite calls. Uh, when the U.S. 10-year hit 
Uh, we like being long duration. It was our number one call. We were calling for a curve inversion. So we still like long duration. We think the 10 year could go to 125. And in fact, we like being short duration as well because I don't think this is a mid cycle cut. Fed's likely gonna cut back to zero over the next 18 months. So don't mind, don't mind the two year, don't mind earning the two year. I would say uh, from an allocation perspective, bring up your cash levels. Um, we're obviously not constructive of the US economy. I would say do not be long regional banks. NIMS will continue to compress. Uh, we do think uh, we will have a brief reinversion of the yield curve, but what will hurt the regional banks more is a drop in loan volumes. Loan volume growth has gone from five to 6% uh, down to about one to 2% when you do a survey of even the top 10 regional banks. Smaller banks are hurting more. So we would stay away from regional finan financials. The, the big banks, who, who knows? I mean, they have investment banking, all sorts of things we can't predict. Um, but, I, but I would say from a tactical standpoint, uh, that's, that's how we would be positioned, going into cash uh, and, and long, both short and long duration on lower rates across the curve. Okay. Unfortunately, we're out of time. But gentlemen, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank thank you. you.